group chat and I will get to them either throughout uh, the panel or at the end of the panel as well and we'll try to get everyone's questions in. Um, and also I always recommend if you see the little reactions uh, option at the bottom of your screen, if you agree with something or you want to show your support to our panelists, there's a clap option and there's a thumbs up, up option as well. So please utilize those as you may. Uh, but as Shane said, I'm uh, this. I'm very excited for this um, conversation. It's very needed, and I'm really looking forward to talking about some of the um, you know racist institution structures, biases, inactions that uh, we presently have in our community. But then also some of the progress that we've seen in our communities as well. And I couldn't think of four better individuals to speak on that this this morning. <laughs> um, so we'll just jump right into it. So the first question that uh, we had for the panelists is obviously you guys all have very, you folks all have very diverse career journeys uh, across Niagara, across Ontario, across the globe. Um, and maybe uh, just to start, we can walk through how have you experienced racism in action and bias in the workplaces that you have been a part of? Um, and Janet, if you don't mind uh, let, leading the way for us this morning. Thank you so much, Mary, for the introduction. And I just want uh, to start by extending gratitude to Leadership Niagara, including me to be part of an important and very timely discussion, given what is happening globally uh, with um, especially the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, and the encouraged to have this somehow difficult conversation. I generally like to believe that I'm a positive person, and I like to look at a glass as a full, uh, instead of half empty. Um, I grew up in Africa in a country that has a history of minority white, but also periods where racism had existed for a number of years. I left a population whose majority is black, uh, black people, and to come to where blacks were the minority. So I was quite naive about the issue of racism. In terms of being a minority at, at, at work, uh, my experience with race has been both positive uh, and negative. It may be, it may not be every day or uh, it might not be towards me per se, but also hearing different stories from other people. Um, on the negative side, they tend to be judgment as you walk in a room because of the color of my skin and what you bring to the table without even being given that opportunity to prove yourself. I have had an experience before. Uh, this was when I was new into the country. Um, I had sent several resumes out and I was looking for a job being new into the area as well. Um, so I got invited for an interview and you can, you can guess how excited I was. And my last name is always perceived as French. And so when I went for the interview, the person who was interviewing me um, passed me in the wedding area, proceeded to go to the receptionist to ask if I had arrived when I was sitting right in front of him with no acknowledgement, none whatsoever. The interview was only a formality. There was not even a single note taken, but there again, you could have had a photogenic memory, who knows? And obviously I didn't get the job, you know? So, but that being said, I'm grateful to have a positive experience with, with my current organization. Um, I work for Well and Heritage, uh, Heritage and also Employment Solution, as uh, Shane alluded. Um, they're very, uh, they embrace culture and diversity. And as, as a black leader, I have the support of the board and my staff members. And my rise within the organization is a testament that I can succeed. I would like to think that the rise had nothing to do with the color of my skin, but the value I bring to the organization. Thank you so much, baby. Awesome, thank you, Janet. And Shane? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, on, on my end, I've never experienced anything, um, I, as you would say, like very expressively racist in terms of job opportunities or, or, or spaces, because for the most part. And I also quickly before I get into that, I also want to acknowledge um, a little bit of what Janet mentioned about um, when you're an immigrant and you move from a country where it's majority uh, blacks or whatever the, the predominant race is that you belong to, um, and then you move 
and when I moved here for school in 2009, I was saying to the group yesterday, like I wasn't acutely aware of my blackness in so many ways as until I, I was here, where it's the smallest things from, you know, you know, uh, we had a whole conversation about just trying to get your hair done or trying to get simple things done. And we, we have a few people that have had experiences where they need to be on TV or the makeup artist, like I've never, I don't know what to do with your skin, to your skin tone and your color. And it's those small things where that person isn't inherently awful for not having worked on a black face before, a person of color face before, but it's just those small things that have never come to somebody's mind at all because the, the group that you're exposed to is monolithic and uh, homogeneous in the way it is made up and what it looks like. So your experiences obviously reflect that. So for me, um, I think one of the biggest things, and I probably haven't shared this a lot with people in the past, um, I came here, my background is in hospitality operations. And I remember that uh, a few moments between me graduating my degree at the college um, and looking for jobs within the hospitality space. And I remember kind of coming across um, and being told within the luxury brand of hospitality companies that I would never be able to work there because I have dreadlocks. And it was one of those things where on the surface of it, it seems as if a, it's an okay HR policy because, well, we just don't allow men to have hair past their ears. Um, and so I dismissed it in the moment because I remember sitting through what would have been, um, I was trying to apply for the company's kind of management track uh, program. And I did my hair back intentionally because I wanted to see how far I was gonna get within the interview. And after the second Skype call, the lady said to me at the end, she was like, well, you know, things seem to be, things seem to be working out. I'll get back to you on the third um, if you, you're moving on. But I do have to ask you a question though. Are you aware that um, of our policy and it seems like you have a bit of a longer hair is that something that you will be willing to cut in order to, to move forward? And I didn't know what to, to make of that conversation at the time. And to be honest, I, I kind of just said, you know, uh, it, it is part of who I am. Like, this is, this is, this is just my hair. Um, and so I understand you and I appreciate your HR policy um, or your grooming policy for men. And she said, well, you know, if it's not something that you're willing to cut, then we're not necessarily sure where, how far this is going to go. So I know immediately where that conversation was going to go. And that was the first of two um, experiences I had within hospitality where the larger brand of luxury, where there is a more, you know, emphasis on refinement of what your servers or your hospital staff, your, your hotel staff looks like. Um, really kind of sets you back because at the end of the day for me it was more of well sure that's a very straightforward HR policy but is the policy not meant to be more about we want our staff to be well groomed and well kept rather than the color of their hair or the hairstyle that they have and so for me there's a lot more people that were more angry about those two pieces than for myself you know I remember friends saying well, you need to get in, you know, cut your hair off, get in, grow your hair while you're manager and flip the conversation. I'm like, it's not a fight I'm willing to have, but it, it goes to show the extent to which the latent, and that's why we talk about systemic or institutional racism. It's not, you know, meant to be bad. And for, as far as they're concerned, we just have a policy that prevents men from having long mullets and Jesus froze, right? Like, for them, it has nothing specific to do with me having dreadlocks or somebody that's Sikh or somebody else. And so how do we create workspaces that are inclusive to the cultures? If you go um, to Jamaica or you're going to the Caribbean or wherever else, I'm pretty sure you'll appreciate and not think anything less of your serving staff or hotel staff if they had dreadlocks because it makes sense for somebody in the Caribbean or in a, a, a predominantly black country to have dreadlocks as their style of choice. So why is that not in play in a North American context or in any other context where you don't expect to see that in, in that way? So, I mean, Maddie, to, to that point, that, that's, the, 
that's the grimmest example I've had. And I think that really turned me away from the hospitality industry because depending on, I was already limited because I was told I can't really reach for high-end luxury brands because most will probably have a policy that will prohibit me from having um, being there, regardless of what skill I bring to the table. So I just thought I would share that. Yeah, no, thank you, Shane. I think that's a great point. And especially when we talk about structural racism, structural bias, a lot of it's normal. Do you know what I mean? Like even we were speaking about this the other day with um, hairdressers or people in school for um, makeup or whatever it is, they're often not um, exposed to working with black hair or exposed to different skin tones to work on. So it's something so ingrained, but thank you. That's a great point. Great point, Shane. Um, And Narai? Hmm. I think, honestly, for on, my most, on the most part, ever since arriving to Canada, I find the ways I've experienced racism in the workplaces that I've worked in is mostly just from the denial that racism exists in the workplace, structural or otherwise, you know, and I found myself in situations where as a Black employee, I am left to, um, to explain and justify feelings of being discriminated against to staff that ostensibly are there to address my problems but often fail to understand them. And uh, I think it is important that in the workplaces, in the HR especially, the people working in those spaces are educated around issues of racism and discrimination and bias because as a black woman working, and especially in the Niagara region, I find there's a lot of bias and there's always an excuse that people do not have it. Um, the experience of working with people, but I think that is not something that can hold water anymore. The world is so global. People have had encounters with other people, whether it's, it might not be physical, but I think it is naive for people to think they're the only race that exists under the sun when there's other people under the, you know, under the sun as well. And so this, I get tired of hearing, oh, well, you know, people are not used to interacting with black people or people have never had this experience. I think the onus is with, uh, on the people, the white people, especially in the region to educate themselves around how other people live or what other people experience. Um, I think the other bias that I have experienced as a newcomer to Canada and as a black person in the region is the questions regarding my competence that have led to fewer opportunities and advancement and where my credentials are questioned because you know I'm a black person and my white counterpart can walk in and if she says she's got a degree it's taken at face value my credentials as a black person have been scrutinized I have to prove myself beyond reasonable doubt that what I am saying I am is what is and so those I think some of my experiences around this region. Thanks, Narai. And I really liked your point about denial as well, because I think we are definitely guilty of that in Canada, uh, because we try to stay very true to our Canadian values of tolerance and kindness and uh, multiculturalism that oftentimes we kind of deny certain things that are very evident and people's lived experiences as well. So that's a great point. So we're going to move on to the next um, the next question. Um, and what do you feel, and this is a broad question, so we can really go several ways here, but what do you feel is the biggest barrier that black professionals face today in the workplace, um, in Niagara specifically, or from any of your experiences, um, in other places as well? Um, and we can start with Shane. I was hoping you would start with Janet. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, I, I think for, I think one of the, the main barriers is it, it, kind of tying off of what Narai just mentioned is that almost running into this context of Niagara is such a small big town, I like to call it, right? So not being originally from here, especially from a, you know, there like two layers of networking, right? There's a face where you're like, oh, everybody knows, you know, Maddie or Janet from whatever role. But then there's like a second layer, which is that impenetrable, like in-group mentality that I found within the community um, where it's not intentional, but it's like everybody knows everybody, right? So I went to school with this person and we grew up together. And you get this kind of unintentional 
um, us against them type of thing. And it's, it's, it's weird when you, you're trying to insert yourself just from a, you know, uh, as a community member or just existing and you feel there's like an invisible barrier. But then what makes it very difficult is to Narai's point where you know what you're feeling and then at the point where you then have to justify, because you're like, wait, am I being irrational? Am I putting up a barrier where none exists? But you know what you're feeling. You know what you're experiencing because of the dynamic between groups or, or, or things like that. And I feel within that space, we always get, you know, oh, well, Niagara is diverse. I've had somebody say to me directly, um, I, don't, I don't really see what the, the, the fuss is all about. Niagara is very diverse. Look at all the Asian restaurants we have downtown St. Catharines. And I was like, wow, that is not the same. And when I said to that person, like, if I can still go to the state of the region or any of the big events in the community, and there's a handful of people of color in a room of 600, you can find myself, Gervin, you know, a few other people, like, we're not there yet. Yes, the, the, let's say the lower tier of our community is diverse, but based on the students that we bring in and the, the new families that come in, when you're looking further up into leadership roles within our community, why is it that we're not seeing that same spread of managers across multiple of our institutions or in key roles across the region? And on one hand, I think it's always been well, we're just getting to be diverse. So it will take some time to get to that point where we're seeing that natural inclusion of people. And I always fight back at that because I think that always gives the sense of, well, it's not, it's not the time yet. It's like, why are we putting it off? Like, it, it, it needs to be something that happens. So for me, I think the being a Black leader here, um, beyond every other imposter syndrome that I have as a young professional as well, you know, being somewhat second guess because I know I look like I'm 17. Thank you. Um, it, it definitely, it definitely adds to that sense of, you know, you need to be three, four times as good whenever you get to the table, right? So that, that always mental calculation of how do I ensure that how I present myself, um, carries beyond, um, somebody shutting me down before I even say anything, right? And I think that tying back to my hospitality experience um, feeds into subconsciously everything, who I, every part of who I am now as an individual, as a leader, is almost like a protest to that experience, right? So I have, you know, I always say I pride myself in not being the guy that you can say, oh, you look like all the other bankers and corporate people in the room because I wear things like this. And while it is a subconscious thing, for me, it was a uh, reaction to being told that what, what does leadership look like? What does uh, the person that's leading an organization should look like? Should we all be, you know, buzz cut with um, military style haircuts and a sharp, you know, navy blue or black only collection of suits? And I, and I refuse to, to buy into that idea that that's what a leader looks like. So I've had people walk by me because they didn't realize I was the executive director of Leadership Niagara and they made up a, a full turn like, oh, and you can see the, the, the toast burning in their head as they try to like, oh, okay, you're the person I've been communicating with through email. Oh, okay, I don't wanna say I didn't expect this from you, but I know that's where the, the, the conversation goes. So it is definitely, I think something that we're always just very conscious of. Like it's not something where I think Janet or Narai and I can just exist without thinking, you know, layers upon layers of what is the implication of this. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thanks Shane, that's awesome. And one point you made about um, people saying, oh, we're, we're, we're getting there in terms of diversity. And it's almost like they're waiting for like a certain number. I will say if you're looking to hire diverse candidates or just reach out to diverse populations, go to Brock, go to Niagara College. We have a number of students coming from outside of Niagara, bringing diversity outside of Canada, bringing diversity. So I would challenge that for sure. Like you said, and, you know, think outside the box along with thinking outside the box of what a leader looks like as well. So thank you, Shane. Um, and Narai? 
Um, for me, Maddie, in my experience, I think there have been four consistent bar barriers. And I'm going to speak to Niagara especially. And the one of the biggest barriers is being Black in itself. That is, I mean, I'm not the corporate skin color. And so when I go into a place looking for a job, it's, it, I'm not going to get it in some cases because of my skin color. So because I can't get out of the container I'm in, that is a barrier that is always going to be there. So that is one of the barriers that I've experienced. The second one and one that is very powerful and people undermine is white women's tears and white men's arrogance in the workplace. You know, we have a lot, there are a lot of um, Amy Coopers and Derek Chauvin's out there running in the workplace. And, um, you know, people are fully aware of the power of their whiteness and they're fully aware that the systems that are in place ensure that they can get away literally with murder in the workplaces. We're dying every day in the workplaces. I think this is something that people are afraid to talk about or even acknowledge because at the end of the day, it becomes an issue of principle over survival. And so am I willing to lose my job to talk about these barriers? Uh, am I willing to risk what the consequences are? And you find a lot of racialized people will not, and especially black people will not speak to the um, barriers that they first face in the workplace because of the real, the very real consequence of either losing your job or forever being um, overlooked whenever there is opportunities to be, uh, you know, to be moved up forward. And the other thing I experience that I find is a huge barrier in this community is false allies. We have people who will come across as wanting to be allies, but most of the times I find it's because they have something to benefit. In my opinion, if you have something to benefit from the relationship between you and the black community, then you are not an ally. And so there's a lot of false allies I find. You pour out your heart to so-called allies and need to find that those things that you have spoken about or the help that you are looking for is turned around against you. And um, I have also come to learn that as a black woman, I could be as effective in my role and have the same or more credentials as my peers, but I will be passed over simply because I'm too serious or because I lack connections because I don't have the complexion for connections or the protection. And so to Shane's point, I think connections, having that network is a big barrier as a black person in the Niagara community. You don't know, there's like a click thing going on in Niagara and having come outside from outside of Niagara and trying to get within those clicks first and foremost is difficult because yeah, you didn't go to school with the next person on the seat. You didn't grow up in the same neighborhood and then your skin color makes it even more difficult to break into those cliques that you were not born in to start with. All right, those are great points, thank you. And especially with that click, and when we speak from a workplace context, a lot of times people will say, well, you'll get a job if you know someone that works in there. You know, like, you know, you know what I mean? You need to know, uh, I forget, I'm, the saying is, is uh, escaping my mind right now um, but that definitely excu excludes people from even getting into the workplace but also you know the workplace is full of power dynamics as is let alone power dynamics that also are not beneficial to black folks either in the workplace so thank you for those points um janet uh thanks mary um for myself i feel like most of the points have been pointed out by nirai and uh, shane so I just wanted to echo about the lack of opportunities, especially uh, bringing the qualification and the experience that uh, we have coming from outside uh, the country. I feel like it's, it's not accepted. We often feel excluded a lot in a lot of things. As, as, as Nirai just mentioned about uh, fitting in to little cliques. And I find that is very, very true. You're often excluded. Uh, excluded. That exclusion piece is so important and vital for people to look and say, you know what, let's just try. Let's just try these new ideas. Let's just bring these people in and see how uh, barriers, you know, like can be broken as well. Like it's very difficult, like with with uh, the, that lack of opportunity uh, to get into senior position a, as a black person, uh, you find other people, your other counterparts, it's easier for them to just roll in uh, because of those segregation legacy issues that still needs to be dealt with. What I mean by that is that that white privilege, the slavery concept that we're already uh, 
in the system and that have been instilled in the system for the last 400 years. So I think that's what I wanted to say on the topic. Awesome. Thank you, Janet. And, it, and again, to your point, it's these structures that have been built for hundreds of years before. So it's definitely time to rebuild <laughs> on those and reshape for sure. Yeah. Um, so on to our next question. And again, the comments, thank you for all the comments and questions so far in the chat as well. Um, they're awesome. So our next question. So you're all involved um, in your workplaces and some, you know, all executive directors, which is amazing, um, but also in the community as well. And we've kind of touched on this already, but can you share a bit more of what it's like to be one of the very few racialized leaders at the table at work, but also in Niagara? Because as Shane says, when you go to meeting, uh, go to events, you see Shane, you see German, you see Nirai, you see Janet. Um, what is that like being one of few racialized leaders in Niagara? And where have you seen progress? And where haven't you seen progress in this? Um, and we'll start with Janet this time. <laughs> oh, it's me again. I thought it would be your eye. <laughs> I'm being ashamed right now. Uh, uh, for me, um, I feel I bring different perspectives uh, because of my cultural background. Uh, but when I'm invited at different tables uh, for different topics and discussions, those different uh, viewpoints are taken differently. They're not taken seriously. And I know like growing up with, with my family, my, my parents always encouraged me to give 300%. I know Nirai and, and Shane echo to this, we're always working harder. You're giving that extra mile uh, to be recognized or even being accepted, right? But it's something that my parents instilled from a young age. And it's, I've carried that in my adulthood and I'm actually trying to pass that on to my children. So I just wanted to raise to be, I was just raised to believe that you need to constantly look at self-improvement uh, and this could be through education or learning new skills or constant job training. So we know people uh, being judged on the basis of their race is something that has been around for a long time as we just mentioned. Uh, uh, but with the recent events happening around the world, in particular the George Floyd case, which really touched me, people are now more open to discuss how society treats them. And in my opinion, I view that as progress. Now we can open up, we can talk about things. And I think that's the start. Um, of changing and bringing out those walls. Another positive progress, uh, there have been black professionals that hold leadership right here in Niagara, which is really an encouragement to see that happening in our own area. Um, but what I would like to personally see going forward is to see more women in top positions. Um, I feel like it's just the two of us, myself and Yara, every meeting I go to, and there are black people, it's just the two of us. So, Having more people of diversity, I think, would bring change. And I think we'll start seeing that inclusion piece coming together. Awesome. Thanks, Janet. And that's that's a great point of also viewing, you know, in, intersectionally um, of what representation looks like on the table as well. Um, so we have one of our panelists, Keithio, has joined us as well. So I'm actually going to put Keithio on the spot right now to answer this question as well, if you want to jump in. And let me know if you want me to repeat the question as well. Uh, yes, please. That that would be that would be helpful. Awesome. So um, I was just saying, all of you guys have been very involved in your workplaces, especially with the senior positions you find yourself in now. But also, you've been involved in the community. So, can you share what it has been like to be one of the very few racialized leaders at the table um, at work, but also in Niagara in general? And where have you seen progress, and where haven't you seen progress? Uh, well, you know, there's. It, I've been in, in Niagara uh, for for a long time, and um, I've had the opportunity to see a fair bit of change uh, since I first arrived in Niagara. Um, I came here as an international student many years ago, uh, and uh, you know St. Paul Street in downtown St. Catharines was a one-way street. Uh, buses didn't run on Sundays, um, and uh, and and there had never been an international student president of uh, of, of the students' union. So. Um, you know, things have changed uh, in the community in, in, in such a unique way, uh, and, and, and progress is slow, right? I, uh, I, I, I was saying this at, um, uh, I, was, I was at uh, both uh, the Niagara Falls and the St. Catharines Black Lives Matter 
um, uh, uh, peaceful marches. And, uh, you know, I, I said progress is, is, is slow and, and there's, a, there's a brief window um, where you're able to affect change uh, in, in the Canadian system, right? So uh, after the election, uh, after municipal elections, they, you know, do a call for council committees. If you want to affect change, get on that committee, uh, you know, have a report elevated to council, uh, ad advance progress that way. Uh, so what I've seen uh, in Niagara is is progress, but at a at a pace that is um, sort of commensurate with the way that progress goes, right? So um, you know you didn't see very many black leaders when I first arrived. Uh, you see lots more. Um, you didn't see very many black families when I first arrived in 2003. Uh, you know the 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 um, the sort of blackness in the community was represented by the student populations. Uh, I was just in Guelph for the last five years, and you know when I came back, uh, I accosted a family to say, "Hey, uh, you guys are a family in Niagara? That's amazing!" And they said, uh, "Yeah, we are, uh, but leave us alone." <laughs> uh, so you know, I mean, there there is a uh, you know progress takes time. Uh, progress does take patience, but uh, progress takes action. So, um, you know, one of the, the biggest questions I wanted to ask, I mean, I, I, I wasn't afforded the opportunity to speak, but one of the biggest questions I wanted to ask at, uh, at both of the Black Lives Matter protests or uh, a peaceful marches, there was 5,000 people in Niagara Falls. My question to, to, to the crowd that was there was, how many of you voted? And how many of you uh, applied for a committee position in, um, in, in you know, any of your city councils or regional council, because those are publicly advertised. And uh, you know, if you want to uh, affect change, that's where the change happens, at the committee level, at the board level, uh, through volunteering and, uh, and, and getting involved. Uh, and it would be great to see more, uh, not only black voices in, in leadership, but more black voices around uh, those committee tables. Now, I mean, the meetings are long and can be a bit boring, uh, but uh, you know, lasting change is is advanced through fairly boring work. Uh, and and you know, my my hope is that we'll see more of that. Uh, you know, inspired around the table. Thank you, Keithio. Yeah, that's those are great points, and I think um, you know it's about getting civically involved. I guess is how you would explain that. But I also think that cities and institutions have to reach out as well. So I think it's kind of a two prong approach too. And you see that with Saint, with uh, City of Saint Catharines, they just created some new um, subcommittees and committees that um, you know bring and encourage more diverse groups to apply to those as well. But thank you. Um, and oh, Shane, you have a follow up. Yeah, no, I, I just want to say to along along those lines, um, I think part of part of the part of the dialogue or part of the conversation is also um, the 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 long haul fight that it need that needs to happen in order for these kind of changes to 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 come into play. And, you know, I think some might say, well, you know, progress needs to happen right now. But we also took how many hundreds of years to build the institutional uh, biases that we have. And so even the cognitive priming that we have been exposed to um, in, in so many facets of our lives. So from um, you're born, you, you're, we're all being programmed with how we process and see the world. So if all you've seen, whether it's in the most innocent of ways of, you know, your drug dealers in a movie are always Latino or some aggressively, you know, black person or your helpers are always positioned as, you know, a pretty, like you may not think or you may not necessarily expect yourself to be thinking, oh, no, no, I don't think, you know, all black people are drug dealers or whatever the case is. But I'm like, it's all those little moments, these micro moments that are happening throughout our lives, whether through TV, whether through the groups or the things that we're soaking up intentionally or unintentionally that are priming all of us with the association. And I use this example all the time in Leadership Niagara when we, we talk about um, things such as when people say, oh, well, it's just a word, like it doesn't mean anything. I'm like, 
words mean something. Words have power. Because if you think about the association that we have with blackness, whether it is the term itself, you think everything from the positioning of good and evil, where you think about the positioning of, you know, what's pure, what's impure, when you think about, you know, white magic and black magic and, you know, almost seeing white magic in the context of heavenly and ethereal and black magic as voodoo and evil and in some way, you know, all that stuff. And I say to people all the time, like, once you start unpacking those things, we're all participating in a system that we're not even realizing how the gears are moving us. And so the same way we participate in marriage, not in the same way that marriage as an institution was formed in the context of chattel, the father selling his daughter to the man and taking the name. No one's getting married in 2020 thinking, yes, I'm chattel to my husband and I'm taking his name. That's not why you're participating. But the history and the, the root of those institutions are in a certain way. And while we may not participate in it in this way, it doesn't take away from the cognitive priming of ownership or, you know, time, which is why, you, you know, see people that don't want to take the husband's name or go equal, right? But it's, for me, like, I take that back to, it's really about everybody stopping to pay attention to what's going on because we're being primed in so many ways with so much information and we actually don't have, we actually aren't realizing the impact that it's having on how we actually view people. I've had people that, you know, we probably all, well, say all, I've had the view in malls where people kind of look at me side-eye because I walk into a store and I was like, I don't feel I need to be dressed to the nine all the time for you to get the fact that I'm not some hoodlum, whatever you, you, you think of. I don't need to be in a suit and tie all the time to justify that I'm no threat to you, right? And so it's those type of things where, I think as a community, um, we need to focus on as we look, as we all try to unlearn the things that we've been exposed to, right? So, uh, Shane, I'm you know I, I you know to to that point. Um, sorry, Maddie, I don't know if you if you covered the ground rules. Am I able to jump in? <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, jump in quickly, and then we're going to go to Narai to finish up this question, and then move on to the next. I mean, just to, to, to Shane's point, right? Like, I'm, uh, I, and I've, I've said this more than once, uh, uh, you know, since since uh, uh, George Floyd, is that you know we we need to have um, a, a Canadian fight on this issue. We need to have a Canadian discussion on this issue, right? I mean, like we have a you know a, a publicly funded healthcare system. Um, and and so the um, the the way to, to impact uh, that healthcare system is very very different from the way that it would happen in America, right? I mean, we have uh, the lo the local health integration board, um, you know, the LINs, and the you know the LIN boards have public meetings that you can attend. Um, you can raise issues at these. Uh, you can. Uh, make a submission through one of your LIN board members, uh, and you know, and 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 affect the healthcare system that way, right? And so, you know, the 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 long haul fight means, you know, you know, committee presentations means thinking about when the meetings are happening, where uh, important things are being decided about your community, and ensuring that you are present for those things to be able to to, to add a black voice to it. Thank you, Kizio. And Narai? The, the difficulty of being last to speak is by the time it gets to me, I've forgotten what the question is. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if I remember correctly, the question was what the experience has been being one of the few racialized leaders in the community in Niagara, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. I think on the most part, I agree with what Shane and, and Janet said earlier about how when you go into a place, there's always the same sus usual suspect, it's either Janet or me, Janet or me in a room. And with that comes the burden of representation. The burden of representation is so real. You know, half of the time you are so, there's a pressure of trying to be perfect and represent your whole race because a mistake on your part is gonna cost somebody else an opportunity to get into that space. And so for me, I have found that 
space of being one of the very few racialized or black leaders in the Afro community very tiring and and uh, I think exhausting is the word. It's very exhausting and the expectations are, are really, really too much on, on us so because of that burnout representation. And I also find sometimes when we sit at these tables, our value only comes in when somebody wants us to speak to the black experience as opposed to being able to give input to what is actually being talked about at the table. You know, so it's almost like you're, you're limited as to how much you can contribute because you're a black person, you couldn't possibly know anything else outside of the black, speaking to the black experience. And so if that could be changed within the spaces that we're navigating, I think, um, if people just kind of educate themselves and realize that, you know, we are not just at these tables as quarters or as part of diversity strat plans, but because we have the skill sets and the qualifications to be at these tables. Yeah, that's a great point. And it's, again, it's, I know, I think Shane said this previously, but it's about relearning, but also rethinking and double thinking why you're doing something. It's the why, right? Like, why am I um, inviting Narai to come speak today? Or why am I inviting Jana to come speak? Is it because I want them to speak about their experience as a Black woman or about their expertise in a wide array of different uh, topics as well? Um, so but thanks, Narai. I just want to add quickly to mm -hmm. that is that I find most of the times people assume we are dumb or blind to what is actually going on. We, we see you, Niagara. I mean, we see the empty talk that is not followed with action. We see the smiles that don't get to the eyes. We see all those things. And so just credit the Black community with some intelligence to know that sometimes it's all talk, talk, talk. We've been doing talks since when here we are. We're still having a panel. We're having a talk and no action is actually being taken. No real changes are happening. And so I find that's one of the well, maybe other people don't experience it, but as near I, I find that um, people assume you do, you, you're dumb. You don't really see what the hell is going on. And we, I see it all the time. I see right through it, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and Naraya, I might come right back to you for the next question, if that's okay, is because I think it speaks a lot to what you just, what you just spoke about. Um, but our next question, so what would you ask of those out there who wish to be stronger allies for racial equity in their own workplaces? So what actions, um, you know, it's not really up to you to necessarily lead the way for allies, but what do you expect from allies right now? Hmm. You know, I think first and foremost, I would ask allies to um, recognize that the word ally is a verb, that it starts with action, that allyship is not a label that you ascribe yourself, that, you know, you, you give yourself. It has to be seen from the work that you're doing with the community that you choose to ally, that you're choosing to, uh, to be an ally for. That's awesome. Yes, to all the allies out there, write that down. <laughs> Allyship is a verb. That's one of my, I think that's one of my favorite uh, sentences of the panel so far. Thank you, Narai. Um, and Keithia? Uh, I mean, the, um, I think allyship is, is, uh, is complicated, right? And um, in, in, in the wake of what happened in the United States, um, uh, you know, I, I, I was pleased to have a lot of um, uh, good friends reach out, uh, check in, uh, wonder about how I was doing and, and how I was uh, feeling about what was taking place. Um, and, and I, you know, I got very much the same question, you know, what, 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 what can I do? Uh, and I said, you know, don't worry about getting it perfect. Uh, just be sincere, uh, be authentic and be open to uh, critique. Um, you know, as, as, a, as, an, as an employee and an alum uh, of uh, Brock University, employee of, of, of Niagara College, I, I was extremely pleased to see uh, the leadership in the statements that were put out uh, by both the president of Niagara College and, uh, and the president of, of uh, Brock University. Um, you know, it, it showed me that that they they sort of took the time to think about what an authentic statement 
would mean to students, staff, faculty, alum, and they weren't worried about being first. They were worried about being authentic. Um, and I saw a lot of other institutions that were worried about being first, um, you know, rather than being authentic. So, you know, I, you know, a a allyship is about authenticity and sincerity and acknowledging the fact that you will not get it right all of the time. Um, and you might get it right with Kefio, but you won't get it right with Shane because uh, we are not a panacea. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I mean, I, 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 you know, I've said this to, to, to more than one uh, person that has asked me about allyship is, you know, I, I, I am not the black pope. So, you know, I do not um, speak on behalf of the entire black community because I view your allyship as valuable to me does not mean that that is the way that you will have to approach every other black person that you see. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I would say about, about allyship is that it, you know, it, it's, you know, it's, it's authenticity and, and sincerity uh, and, and accepting that you will not get it right 100% uh, of the time. Awesome. Thanks, Keithio. And it takes that like individual empathy is kind of what I like to call it is that you can be, you know, try to put yourself in someone else's shoes, but just because you did that for one person does not mean it will be the same for the next person. Um, so thank you. Uh, Shane? Yeah, uh, again, great points um, by everyone. Um, I think what I'll add to that too is within that context of, you know, what organizations or a business can do in order to to strengthen that work I, I think it also involves you know in in, a, in consort with what Keith here just mentioned in terms of not necessarily being fearful of getting it wrong right like it's it's one place for sure where analysis by paralysis will get you to inaction because we're so worried about not you know stepping on a toe here and is it the right statement and I think there's also from or from the group that you're an understanding or being comfortable with, even Keith's point, not everybody within that group that you're trying to ally with will see your action as the positive intention that it was meant to be. Because even with authenticity and um, some people can read whatever they want into it based on what they bring to the table, right? And you can't control that. But I think that even having the conversation is also being mindful of how you ask questions and what you're expecting that person you're trying to learn from to regurgitate because part of reaching out part of understanding means narai janet keith you and i are repeating the same um, feelings and trauma or whatever it is that you're experiencing to every single caring person that is asking what do you feel about this what should I do about, and it, it becomes tiring, even though everyone means well, but it, as the host of the emotion that is emoting to every caring person that's there, um, then the burden becomes on you as the person to, okay, all right, you know, every single time I have the discussion about what's going on in the world, I get choked up about it, just because it, you're almost reliving the hurt and the pain in your attempt to, you know, get somebody to a place of understanding, right? So there is there is a dual role in that allyship, which is why you know Narai's point about it's a verb. It's the it's definitely about action, and it's the action is not just getting Narai to tell you what you need to do. Is you picking up the encyclopedia and reading from page to page to come to the table with something rather than expecting. Um, the person you're trying to ally with to educate you from a to z on the topic like you need to come halfway through the alphabet and then that person can help you to the end and i think sometimes in that expectation at least what i've witnessed over the last couple of months is there's a lot of people that think that the context is i'm asking the question so you need to tell me all that there is and they're like no 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 do some of the work first because otherwise i'm just feed, spoon feeding you knowledge and i don't think that's really helping you advance and get to your understanding so that's that's the piece i would add to both narai's and keithia's point about it being a dual piece of um listening and just being mindful of how you're asking those individuals to re-traumatize themselves um, we know how we all probably feel about george floyd like it's probably not if you're a human you should probably feel a certain way 
it, it's there's not a there's not a, there's a unique lens to it yes because there's multiple George Floyds out there and it rings differently for you but there's some there's some things that you can say I'm human too I would know how I probably feel in this way so I don't necessarily need to start at that point uh, with this person I'm trying to ally with encyclopedia sure. I know I, I figured Shane, Shane you're I figured a young you're a young man Google. what do you what do you know about, what do you know about encyclopedia <laughs> I figured saying Google or Wikipedia was just not a valid source and to emphasize the point of it's not as easy, um, the work is not as easy as just Googling it. It's probably the whole school library research of physical <laughs> mm. finding the reference book, you know, combing through the pages. Um, so I was being very meta with my description. <laughs> <laughs> No, and Shane, thank you for that. It's doing. It's simply doing your homework. It's not like you go to class and not do your homework, unless you were me and <laughs> in my first year. Anyways, um, and Janet. Well, thanks, Shane, for that education. I really appreciate that. Anyway, uh, in my own perspective, like to be a strong ally, I believe we need to come out of our comfort zones. I think forgiveness is key and. And just that piece of reconciliation, uh, I feel one has to, to be self-aware of their own biases because honestly, we all do have them. Um, and then next, just to create that dialogue, right? How would I encourage uh, individuals to speak out, like to, to affect change inside out? I think it's probably important to start within your family and then proceed to your communities. Uh, breaking racial barriers within your own inter inner circle um, I think allows other people to respond positively because people tend to uh, divert to people that they already know. And, and then it becomes a ripple effect, right? Losing your own platforms, your Facebooks, your Instagrams, everything that can influence or shape uh, this conversation, I think will be a great help. Um, for me, I know it's, it's a very uncomfortable com uh, topic to discuss with people. It's easier now with the George Floyd situation, um, but unfortunately it has to be heard. It has to be spoken out. We have to speak out and we have to start now. So for myself really to be that strong ally, just, just be self-aware of those biases and, and start moving on. Thank you, Janet. And again, it, that kind of your piece about feeling uncomfortable about the topic of race is that a lot of times people think that talking about racism or inaction or bias in the workplace is very taboo. It's not, some people might say it's not appropriate to talk about that in the workplace, but I think it should start in the workplace since we now many of us have actually brought our workplace into our homes as well. So even now more than ever, it is important to throw those kind of ideas of not talking about tough or per more personal topics like racism and bring them into the workplace for sure. Thank you, Janet. And um, uh, Maddie, and I'll just yeah. like to add just quickly um, in that, you know, let's not be, don't be fearful of, you know, being the, being a pro millennial, I get the snowflakey thing all the time, but don't, uh, don't be fearful of being, you know, people throwing or weaponizing the whole PC culture thing um, against you if you're trying to speak up against things that are happening, even in the microaggressions that you may notice, um, because then it's easy to weaponize, oh my God, I can't say anything now. Everything I say, I'm offending somebody. And mm -hmm. that really takes a sting away from people that are like, well, I should say something and I sh you should say it all the time because until you do, we won't correct those behaviors, right? So it's not just for the kitchen table, um, it's more so if it's happening in the workplace, like don't be afraid of somebody weaponizing the whole you're being too PC and I don't know how to walk and walk in eggshells around everybody because I think that's the first way people try to disarm the conversation from happening at work or in spaces where it's like, let's just focus that, on. Yeah, that's I a, mean, I, that's I a would, great point. Shane, I, Maddie, sorry, I, I, I would, uh, sorry, sorry, Nara, sorry. I, I just, I, I wanted to, to, to quickly jump off of that point because I think it's, it's really important. Um, Shane, I, I mean, I don't know if you can call yourself a pride millennial and, and talk, talk about the, uh, an encyclopedia at the same time. Uh, just, uh, just making sure that you have your, your facts right. Um, I'm good. Okay, all right, fine, 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 fine. Um, but but what, I, what, what I will say is that, you know, the, when, when, uh, when I was in Niagara Falls, when I was in St. Catharines, 
uh, peaceful protests, one of the signs that I saw was um, silence equals violence. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you are, um, you know, if, 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 if you're in the workplace and, uh, you know, you see a, a, a colleague uh, say something that, that, that shouldn't be said, right? Because uh, you know, I've, and I've said this before, right? Someone does not go and, and graffiti a black church on a whim in one day. They are constantly reinforced, right? It's one racist joke amongst friends that nobody says anything. It's another racist joke amongst family that nobody says anything. It's another racist joke amongst colleagues that nobody says anything. All of a sudden, you, you feel quite empowered to go and, uh, and, and graffiti a racist slur on a on a uh, at a black church, right? So, you know, I mean, the the the, the sort of millennial PC culture. I mean, I'm an, I'm an old man. Uh, uh, when when Shane was in school, I, I was on my my fifth career. Um, but you know, the the millennial PC culture, I, I think, is a bad way to characterize it because it requires intervention even in what might be considered the most mundane situation, um, you know, somebody tells some, some microaggression joke at work, intervene, say something, uh, because that person is starting with, uh, you know, that racist joke at, uh, at, 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 in the workplace, where they end up, right, because they're constantly in, reinforced, might be somewhere quite dangerous. Just Cinder, right, you on that. When um, Keith here is speaking about a banner, and I remember I was actually carrying that banner that says white violence, <laughs> white silence is violence at the protest in Niagara Falls. And I find that um, the best allies I have met have stuck their necks out for me, literally, in the workplace, speaking to, speaking out for other people, you know. They've helped me climb and they gave me rare opportunities by mentoring and sometimes even sponsoring my growth. And I think that is a huge piece of allyship. You know, I'm not saying everybody should go out and spend money on a black person, but in my experience, I have found out my best allies have been those people that have done that for me. And with organizations, I find that for them to be authentic allies and support diversity and inclusion for black professionals, a thoughtful approach to instilling change is actually needed. You know, more investments need to be made towards racial equity instead of knee-jerk reactions that are happening in organizations, they need to be accountable, right, by committing to, to more diverse plans that are not just for the social media platforms that look, we have, you know, because at the end of the day, if the diversity programs or threat plans that they have are just there, I'm finding more and more, especially, I don't know if it's happening else, but in Niagara, the word, we have a diverse, the words that we have a diversity plan have become like, I have a black friend, I'm not racist. And, and so that kind of shuts down every issue of racism and discrimination in the workplace. It's like, oh no, we've got a diversity plan here. And so I think if organizations for them to be allies could just have a systemic, you know, uh, intentional um, piece to actually instill racial equity in the workplace, that would be great. Thank you, Naran. Yes, that intentionality for sure. Um, and we're going to move on to our final question, and then we're going to move on to um, some questions from our audience today as well. Um, so in one sentence, one or two sentences, if you had to give one piece of advice for someone coming up behind you, a young Black professional who wants to succeed at work but maybe face some of the barriers we talked about today, what would you tell them? And I'm going to start with Shane. Uh, you do this to me all the time. Um... <laughs> Remember, only one to two sentences, Shane. Good. Uh, what I would say is two things I live by. Um, you're, you don't compete. So me saying to them, like, you're not competing with anybody else. Uh, my view has always been I compete with myself, right? So my ambition, my push, my drive is not based on those around me. It's based on my own standards and where I want to go and how I'm pushing myself because then that takes away from the comparison culture and it really focuses on me and my own growth mindset. Um, and that's supported by the fundamental belief that I think we all share as Black individuals that I have to be 
three times as good as the next person beside me. So that is a double whammy on my end because as a young person, I think all young people feel that, you know, need to be twice as good to show up. Um, but also as a young leader of color, um, that is something that I have to always ensure I'm, I'm, I live by. And that shows itself in not just how my, my overall deportment, but it's also how I carry myself. It's also how I prepare for things because I don't want the first thing that you say to me uh, in terms of shutting down an idea is not uh, you assessing my credibility based on what I look like on the outside, whether it's young or black. So I always ensure that I am 10 sheets deep in my prep because I know I want to make sure I have a rebuttal for every point or anything that might come up that is has nothing to do with anything beyond um, what I look like. So you compete with yourself and that will always get you to be pushing yourself beyond your competitors or your friends or your colleagues and having that mindset that you do have to be two, three times um, of a harder worker than the next person beside you. Awesome. Thanks, Shane. And Janet? Positivity is the way forward. You say two sentences, right? <laughs> uh, I know there will be challenges everywhere, but even if you're a minority, I know, I know you can succeed. So to that young black person, I would say persevere. Awesome. Like two sentences. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. Narai? I think the first thing I would say to the young black person is that they are not crazy. You know, you are not crazy to suspect that there is a connection between negative treatment and bias. And that, you know, the battle will drive them to the ground, the battle against racism and discrimination, but that, and it will make them angry and it's okay to be angry. But the key is to use that anger in ways that will not feed the broken narrative, but to take that anger and channel it in ways that make them rise. They have to step out the negative. I'll step out of the negative. Um, wait, I've lost my point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they have to step out of the negative contracts in constructs in order to make themselves more reliant, reliant and mentally secure. And uh, they have to reach out to mentors, reach out to the supports that are there with from community organizations. You, it's it's your mental well being is important. And so reach out to the supports that are in the communities that support or um, look after your mental wellness. That's awesome. Thanks, Narai. And Keithio, ending us off? Uh, yes. I mean, I, I, I really need to see some ID from Shane. He keeps calling himself a young person uh, <laughs> that, that talks about going to the library and, and looking at an encyclopedia. You probably know what Netscape is. How can you be a young person? Uh, I, I, I would say I would say two things. Um, uh, one would be um, uh, feel comfortable to fail, uh, because failure is part of growth. Um, and if you fail, you are not failing your race. Uh, you are, you know, people people fail professionally all the time, and uh, and they grow from it, right? I mean, in in, in Silicon Valley, it's fail fast and fail cheap. Um, so, so feel comfortable to fail because, because failure is, is valuable. You'll, you'll be able to learn from, from that failure and, and grow and know that, um, you know, if you do fail, uh, you know, you have not let down your race, you know, you're just a person, uh, like everybody else and, and, and you deserve the license to be able to fail. Uh, the second thing that I would say is build a network. Um, you know, like that is, uh, to Narai's point about, you know, you're not crazy. Sometimes you can be so wrapped up in, um, in, in that daily battle, uh, that you forget about the value of building, um, uh, a network and investing in a network and invest, you know, a network that, that you know, it doesn't have to be a black network, but, you know, having a network to be able to tap into being able to pick up the phone and uh and and you know say to ceo xyz hey you know i i i i wouldn't mind 45 minutes of your time would you mind giving that to me uh you know you should be able uh to do that and one of the things that i uh that i'm i'm quite proud of is is um uh you know how much i invested in my my personal network you know i came to canada in 2003 you know, with two suitcases and then know anybody. And, and, you know, as I was returning back to Niagara, 
uh, a year ago after my time away in Guelph and I was tapping back into to, um, my, my network of people that uh, I wanted to just have a conversation with, um, I, I was quite pleased that there were so many people that were willing to give me their time. And uh, I said, you know, I mean, I, I sort of built it by mistake. <laughs> I should have been a bit more intentional about it. But, uh, but, but I, I, I would say that to any uh, young black, any professional, but any young, any young black professional, you know, uh, have the freedom to fail and, um, and, and invest in your network. Awesome. Thanks, Keithio. And before we wrap up, I'm going to um, get some Q&A from the audience. Um, and I'm going to hand it off to actually one of our audience members that have posted some wonderful uh, questions. So Jermaine, I'm going to uh, hand it off to you if you wanted to just ask your questions uh, directly to the panelists. Yeah, thank you so much, Maddie. Wonderful panel, everyone. Very insightful, very informative. I really enjoyed it. I've been doing, going to all of these lately and they've been great. So I'll try to be very quick and I might just smash two questions together. So the first one had actually arisen earlier when um, Shane had been talking a bit about that hair piece and around, you know, the racism that sort of manifests within that sphere. And I had just been sort of curious around your thoughts relating to how it is that Black queerness has oftentimes been overlooked in the discussions around Black workplace equity and equality and issues of Blackness in general, particularly in Niagara, considering that for instance, a gender fluid black person, when it comes to conversations around like hair and grooming requirements, they wouldn't neatly fit into the masculine or feminine requirements of grooming, mm -hmm. um, as well as like myself having experienced a bit of that sort of queer phobia and anti-black queer phobia in the workplace, myself being a queer gender fluid person. And then following up on Keithio's points, which are very, very well grounded, but um, as someone has, who has also sort of been involved in a lot of anti-racism work with the Human Rights and Equity Office, with the Social Justice Center, just been on a lot of different panels and committees, I am always very curious and, you know, been contacted recently about like, oh, Niagara's, City of Niagara's doing this, you should go and like join this committee. I've thought around how most of these committees tend to be volunteer-based, meaning, you know, no financial compensation for membership. And as we know, with that wealth disparity across Canada and North America, one of the groups that is least able to freely give that kind of unpaid time and labor is the Black demographic. So while many would want to join these kinds of committees, struggling through the economic difficulties and emotional labor that we oftentimes have to do on a daily basis makes it an additional bar to join a committee or panel that would sort of further tax or exacerbate the situations for no tangible compensation. Do you think that it would be advised that say the city of St. Catharines, as well as other cities that are trying to champion these diversity and inclusion committees, be committed to committing some form of honorarium for the individuals who would come to sit on them, as opposed to sort of continuing to exploit black labor? Um, and you know, just a bit, so not that there isn't any tangible immediate sort of like results of you know, long-term benefits, AKA the ending of racism, but in that sort of immediate, those financial costs of life and the mental health. How do these committee positions for all the good that they enable us to do also contribute to those harms, um, disproportionate taxations of black bodies, you know, free labor, which, you know, as a black body, I'm very sensitive to free labor, you know, given our history. Um, yeah, so thoughts. I know who wants to go first. I don't know if, I don't know if Shane is maybe looking it up in his encyclopedia. Uh, so I, 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 I will go first. I, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go first, Shane, if you don't mind. Do you want me to go first? Yes, go ahead. Uh, so I, you know, I, I think you raise a very important point around, around, um, around an honorarium, you know, and, uh, and, and, you know, that has a lot of value, you know, the, the, I, I, I've said, I've said many, 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 many times throughout, uh, um, all of the, the Black Lives Matter work is that leadership matters. Um, and in the city of St. Catharines, uh, you know, the leadership of the mayor of, of Walter Sendzik has has mattered when it when it's come to um, anti-black racism, diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, uh, I, of course, I have a history with Walter. I, I, I knew him since my chamber days. Um, but but those are the types of proposals that councils need to hear about uh, honorariums. And you know, it's one thing to raise it on this this uh, call, Jermaine. Uh, but it's another thing to write to your mayor. Uh, and get it um, on the official record that you are, you know, you think that that um, uh, you know committees should have honorariums for volunteers that sit around the table, get council to to consider it, get them to vote on it, get them to pass it one way or the other, uh, because again, it's back to that, you know, silence is violence, right? So if 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 a council turns it down, clearly they have stated their position about 
who it is that they want around the table, you know, affluent individuals that can freely give up their time. Um, but, you know, you, you, you have to get it on the record, right? You, you put it in a letter, write to your mayor, uh, get them to, to uh, sort of stick to the words that they uh, said at those protests and have said uh, openly about diversity and inclusion. And I think you raise a, really, a number of very important points about, you know, who has the ability to give their time freely. I think Keith, Keith, you, Keith you answered it uh, well. I mean, I could go into even your first point around just the Black queer experience and, you know, what that looks like as well. Um, but, I mean, you clearly have it uh, all together in that context. And I know there is some, there is always the, to even the rise point or, or a, whenever you're the first or you're the one of you until it's normalized, you bear the burden of being that person, right? So, you know, being the Black queer leaders, like, is that what you want to be defined by? Like, you don't walk in and in, you don't want that to be the, the thing that is, um, that old shines the work and contributions that you're making. It is part of who you are, but is not what you lead with, right? Like we, and I say this to people all the time, like, I don't necessarily need to, need to lead or think people need to lead with their sexuality because in a heteronormative world, people don't lead with their straight, right? Like it's, it's just not a, thing that you say your name and then introduce yourself as, you know, oh, I'm straight, right? Like it's okay, that has no bearing on work or what we're doing in this context, right? So I, I think your your points are very valid in that that in that space. And it's interesting you made the, the connection between um, the work like civic action and civic engagement. And there's a balance I think we need we need to find as a society in trying to get people mobilized and involved in enacting change. But also, as you mentioned, I just thought about an article that I briefly read that was just mentioning or breaking down the, the institution of internships and what that means for uh, the racialized minority within schools in terms of how that, you know, generally internships support um, the privileged bit because their parents can pay for housing and all those other stuff. So an internship is even something as simple as innocent as that. Um, you know, for students that don't have it, um, it becomes a question of, okay, now I have to give free labor. I need to still work and pay rent. I don't have a mommy and daddy and all that stuff to put me up and pay for groceries and all this type of stuff for me to get this caliber experience uh, for free somewhere else. So well put, and, and thank you so much for, for being here and, and, and positioning those questions. Thank you, really appreciate it. Yeah, and if you, if you don't mind me just saying, jumping in, Maddie, is this okay? Let, let oh me yeah, no, not. go ahead, go ahead. So I've actually myself struggled a lot with that sort of idea around the centering of sort of race and queer experience as qualifications in the sense that I do believe that in a world in which, you know, the default is whiteness and heterosexual, heterosexuality and heteronormativity as the foregrounded sort of expertise. So they, they don't need to say it, I believe, because it's already been said by the systems. So I, I oftentimes struggle with the idea that, you know, I do have like lived experience. And, you know, when you sometimes come across job applications, they're like, oh, you know, you have to have lived experience because that's, that's vital. It's like, we have a hard time, I think, quantifying or sort of stating that actually, yes, me being like a queer person in this field actually does bring with it certain lived experiences, certain gravitas, or like me having, like I'm an immigrant from Jamaica, like I have certain lived experience when it comes to certain conversations that does, that does warrant bringing up. Um, and then sort of like being able to do that, but then also wanting to avoid being seen as only for that, um, like only as like the black queer person, only as, which I think it's less, like in my conceptualization of it, it's less an issue on the part of us sort of like presenting ourselves that way, or sort of like manifesting the fact that, hey, I do have value in my lived experience. And hey, yes, it is important that this is a, so this is a conversation that does need to happen around me being like a queer black person or a black woman or like a black man, like it is something that is relevant. But if it's a case where the audience is only able to sort of like hold either you as a non-racialized or sort of like racially homogenous, sexually homogenous person, or you as only like a black queer person, then it's less so in that the issue is us presenting as that, more so in the audience only being able to sort of hold one or the other as opposed to, oh, there is value and weight to your blackness and there's value and weight to your queerness and you are also an individual. 
Um, because I think, again, like that binaristic way of thinking that they've been indoctrinated into through, through a lot of Western education, if that makes any sense, I sort of rambled for a bit there. Oh, thank you. That makes um, the, Naraya or Janet, do you have anything to add? Uh, for myself, you know what, I just wanted to echo what Shane and, um, um, and Akitio said. Honestly, it's just making everybody accountable. I know during, especially the matches that has been happening recently, so many promises have been made. So if we can, as, as the black community, hold everybody accountable to what their promises were, that will be great. That will be our starting point to move this initiative forward. I completely agree with that, Maddie. I, I, I personally am done with the talk, 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 and promises, promises, promises. You know, it's, a, it's I almost sometimes I feel like me and my daughter, where my daughter says, mommy, this, and I'm like, oh, we'll do it, and I promise, and I promise. And I just <laughs> kind of like, you know, I know I'm never going to do it, but I'll tell her, of course, sweetheart. And we, as a Black community, are in that situation. We are always being told, of course, sweetheart, we've got policies, we'll align it this way, and nothing actually ever gets done. So if we could just move from the top to action, I think now is the time. I mean, I it's way overdue. It's not even now is the time. It's, it's way overdue. People actually now need to just stop talking and do. Allyship, like I said, is a verb. Let's just get on with it. So moms uh, say that they're going to do something and know that they're not going to. I don't to. know, Keith. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, 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 you're, now you're exposing um, <laughs> So just, just in the sake of time, though, I just wanted to um, wrap it up with one last uh, Q&A question. But I also just want to address the elephant in the room regarding um, the All Lives Matter comment that was left in the group chat. I don't really want to waste any of our panelists' energy on that, to be perfectly honest, because I do see that that person has left the uh, chat anyways. But I wanted people to know, like, you can't just let that kind of sit there. Um, so, you know, we have seen it in the chat and obviously um, it seems like that person just put it to get attention. So I really don't want to put that negative energy onto our panelists or any other um, black folks in um, this chat today as well. But if anyone wants to comment on it, you can, but I do want to end off on a positive note uh, and a note with action as well. Um, so what, just to finish off, what um, local organizations, uh, not for profits that maybe are uh, led by a black individual in Niagara do you hold close to your heart where would you like to get more attention shone, shined on um, for the organizations that you all work with and we can start with Narai since I know you have a organization close to your heart Ah, uh, sorry, Maddie. What was the question again? Um, what organization um, or non-for-profit or company uh, is something that you hold close to your heart in Niagara and that you want to shine a light on? for the end of this session? Hmm. Oh, dear. Well, outside of Toes Niagara, of <laughs> course. <laughs> there you go. Um, I think there's quite a whole lot of community organizations that are doing great work in this region, in, especially for Black youth. Um, and even the university, I know from my experience with working with Brock University, uh, the Human um, Resources and Equity Department at Brock is, I would like to shine a light on the work they are doing there for the Black community, for the Black youth and the Black community in general. Awesome, thank you. Anyone else? For myself, I think I echo Nyerai's uh, words. Of course, talking about wealth and heritage, we do, uh, we deal with a lot of multicultural, different multicultural ethnicities. Um, uh, but that being said, I work closely with Brock as well, and they have been phenomenal, especially in this kind of uh, conversations and dialogues. Keith, you Shane? Uh, go for it, Shane. No, no, go ahead. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Is that your way of saying that you don't have anything to say yet, so you want me to go first? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, I think it was age before beauty. <laughs> Uh, any, Narai, you've already let out secrets that moms just say that they'll do something <laughs> and, and they have no intention of doing it. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I, I would say that um, uh, I'm, I'm extremely proud of, proud of uh, Toes Niagara. Um, it's very hard to uh, have a, a startup nonprofit. Um, you know, there's that uh, big gala that they do. There's money raised for scholarship. Um, you know, there's, 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 uh, 
uh, politicians that, that, that go, business people that go to, to, to the annual event. I mean, that's, you know, it, bootstrapping a not-for-profit anywhere, but bootstrapping a not-for-profit in Niagara is, is uh, particularly difficult. So uh, very proud of Toes. Um, I, I would say that, I'm, you know, uh, just because of my, my direct link to both Niagara College and Brock University, I'm, I'm very proud of the work that they're doing. Um, you know, there's been a real, as I mentioned, authentic investment in um, a clear conversation on diversity and inclusion, on uh, rethinking what their, the, the sort of staff complement, faculty complement looks like, uh, and, and just being um, constantly invested in, uh, in, in the work that's being done. And then last but not least, uh, though it pains me to compliment this particular person, uh, I think that the work that Shane is doing at Leadership Niagara has lots of value. Um, you know, the, 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 the ethos of Leadership Niagara is you sort of take a cohort of people that are, are um, uh, you know, poised for leadership in, in organizations. You uh, do intensive civic engagement with them. And, and you send them back to their workplaces. Um, you know, that uh, Shane was able to take the leadership on to host a conversation like this and engage that cohort of young leaders. I mean, those people are going to go back to their companies and, and, and maybe not tomorrow they'll be the CEO, but, but when they become the CEO, uh, you know, this, this conversation will, will have stuck with them. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it takes it takes a lot of courage to be able to uh, to do this because um, you know Shane is tying sort of his blackness to his professional career and uh, and 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 many times uh, there are black professionals that uh, I mean to to Jermaine's point right I mean um, am I am I a professional or am I a black professional and 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 Shane has sort of stuck his neck out to say you know if we are training the next cohort of young leaders um, in Niagara. It is important that they have uh, knowledge of this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Just to jump in quickly, Kithio, thank you for just the words you spoke about toes. Um, and I just want to add on top of the that the gala that we do to raise scholarships for students, it's also a mentorship platform where again we get the black leaders in the community to mentor the young black youth to have them aspire to be more and see themselves represented in the areas that they they want to go into and i think i would also like to highlight and um and i know this is probably going to be controversial but the niagara regional police uh, with the way i work with them as toes niagara they mm -hmm. have actually been very intentional with working with the black community we just had a session with them um, recruitment was targeted specifically for black youth and black members of the community so i would like to acknowledge them for that as well no that's true thank all right thank you that's and that's awesome to hear as well uh from the niagara regional police too and i can also attest that toes is awesome and that mentorship piece is so important i'm sure we could have a panel um just on black mentorship as well um but i think that brings us to the end of the panel discussion so i just want to say a huge thank you to our panelists for taking the time to participate to share and to just give everyone such awesome knowledge and insights and also strategies and tips too i actually have a full notebook full of all of the things that you guys have said so thank you for your energy and time and thank you to leadership niagara for giving me the opportunity to moderate this session it was, um, it was awesome. And thank you for the attendees uh, that came today and for all of your questions and comments. It was so hard to keep track of all the comments in the, in the chat, but I think we did it. So thank you again. And I'm sure if you ever had any more questions, our panelists would be happy to, um, you know, touch base with you another time or whatever they're comfortable with. And finally, we want to also thank our sponsors for today, Royal LePage Niagara Realtor Bro Brokerage for supporting this community conversation. And this, all, this conversation also continues as well. So I'm going to hand it off to Shane to talk about next steps with this community uh, chat series and also next steps in general because it doesn't just stop with this uh, conversation. But thank you everyone. Yeah, again, thank you to, to the panelists. Thank, thank you to Maddie. I also want to send a special thank you to Michelle Grigowski, who's uh, one of our board members here at Leadership Niagara, playing tech support in the back end and monitoring um, all of this and Michelle and I really worked hard on this Niagara Nova piece so 
want to thank her for the tremendous support that she's provided in helping us champion this dialogue. Um, just want to leave everybody with this as a reminder that this is not the be all and end all of all conversations. We could have a whole, you know, 10 hour conversation around the black experience and still not cover everything. So, um, or panelists were aware that I'm really grateful for everyone's um, two and four cents that they contributed to to this conversation. And based on the comments that we're seeing, I think a lot of people walked away with something, which is the hope that we want. Um, and as of a, as a follow up, the next thing that we're doing in this series next week, Wednesday, we're having a uh, a sister part to this dialogue in terms of what can we do, which is basically a larger conversation about how can we improve diversity and inclusion at work. So we'll have a fantastic lineup of speakers again, Michelle Grigowski, uh, Teresa McLennan, and Enzo Dividitis, um, who will be talking in a more broad strokes piece as to what institutions and organizations can do in order to help move the needle forward around diversity and inclusion, um, and actually put, state, put action behind the statements that we've also beautifully created over the last couple months. So um, looking forward to join you joining us next week. It will be the same time, August 5th at 10 o'clock um, with the same format. So thank you again to everybody who is in attendance. Thank you. Final thank you to uh, Royal Page Niagara Realty Brokerage for supporting this vital conversation. And we look forward to uh, furthering this uh, format with Leadership Niagara. So thank you, everyone. And uh, see you next week if you're, if you're, uh, if you're around. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.